Okay, we're ready now. It looks like it's okay. Hi, my name is Paula Gloria, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole because we like to go into topics more deeply. And we also like to present to you uh, voices and viewpoints that oftentimes, because of certain limitations that exist in the society today with big corporate media and uh, messages that people are more familiar with, sometimes those messages that people are less familiar with, even though very well founded in scholarly thought, don't quite hit the radar, uh, they don't get peer reviewed, and as a result, we have very valuable tools that are missing when we're searching to, uh, to get our way out of thorny problems. For those of you who are followers of my show, I'd like to introduce my co-host, which will be Posar. And Hello. Posar Posar is, is known at the Manhattan Neighborhood Networks for his work in cameras in the courts. And I'm hoping that we can do more work with Posar and Carl Pearson, who has some very practical ideas. Uh, Carl, as you know, is the attorney who designed the 9-11 uh, ballot initiative. And he also uh, helped to found what today is the whole uh, paralegal institution. So uh, we're going to be hearing more from Carl in the future. Uh, Carl likes practical solutions, and what I'm trying to do is hook his attention to binary economics. And binary economics is not something academic or uh, something that only those in uh, behind the ivory towers understand as methods to help people. But it's something that if the common man better understood, he could more articulate where he wants to put his energies in a democratic society. So what I want to do is introduce two guests today. One uh, has been a guest on my show many times, and that's Robert Ashford. Uh, Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be back. Yes, and I want to say that uh, people can find our shows that we've done in the past on um, YouTube. If you go to youtube.com slash Paula Gloria, go into the playlists, and what you will see is a list of um, shows that I've done with Robert Ashford and I'm just going to say that he is a professor of law at Syracuse University in the College of Law. His subjects include binary economics, business associations, public corporations, professional responsibility, and securities um, regulation. You hold a JD with honors uh, from Harvard Law School and a BA uh, with the major from um, majors in physics and English, and uh, wow, it just goes on and on with you, Robert Woodrow Wilson Fellowship at Stanford University. Uh, you've written books on binary economics with Rodney Shakespeare, uh, and also you studied under Lewis Kelso. At this point, I'd also like to say you're a mu you're a, a very good musician. He's done beautiful works that oftentimes smooths out my nerves and those that I'm working with. So um, thank you, Robert, for joining us again. Pleasure. Now, Norman Kurland, let me see if I can get a nice shot of his bio because he's going to be new to my viewers today. He is a lawyer, economist, pioneer of employee stock ownership plans, ESOPs, and a leading adv global advocate for the Just Third Way, a post-scarcity development model that transcends both capitalism and socialism by combining free markets with the democratization of economic power and capital ownership. He serves as president of the All-Volunteer Center for Economic and Social Justice, CESJ, a nonprofit think tank headquartered in Arlington, Virginia, you co-founded with Father William Ferry and other economic and social justice advocates in 1984. Uh, Mr. Curlin also founded and heads Equity Expansion International, Inc., an investment banking firm for the have-nots, which implements just third-way strategies around the world to turn non-owners into owners. He is a co-founder of Global Justice Movement, or org, dot org, based in Canada and the Revolution, American Revolutionary Party launched in April 2005. He has taught binary economics and binary policy reforms in privatization seminars at the International Law Institute in Washington, D.C. 
In 1985, President Reagan appointed Mr. Kurland as Deputy Chairman of the Bipartisan Presidential Task Force on Project Economic Justice to promote economic democratization through ESOP reforms in Central America and the Caribbean. So at this point, what I want to just say, and, and welcome, Norman. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to dedicate this show to one of the most important comments that I got on YouTube, and I highlighted it as such. I got it on Warren Cucurillo on 9-11 and pornography of all places. It turns out this is a soldier in Iraq, and he I had a little back and forth with me saying how much he appreciated uh, this great guitar player from Duran Duran and I told him that I asked him if I could do a show with him and he said it wasn't possible while he was serving over there and then I said I moved his comment over to um, my PaulaGloria.com spot which I usually use for nasty comments so I can use Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication techniques to find out what the unmet needs are so we can keep in connection people who have very different viewpoints. And what I told him was, I said, stay tuned. His name is Doedoe2, -D -O -O I think, Dodo, Dodo1, that's his handle on YouTube. And I said, stay tuned and pay attention to my playlist on binary economics because my understanding is that a great man, Louis O. Kelso, uh, who was mentor, I know, to both of you, had said that ours is a blood economy and that there are bright solutions. So um, he said that that made his day and the idea that I could help make someone's day who's serving in Iraq was, was just wonderful. And I want to thank both of you gentlemen for joining us today to see if we can resolve some of these problems. Would you like to start, Norman, about where you see things standing? global crisis over money and debt, and, and there could be a free fall of the economy for the level to have levels of unemployment similar to the Great Depression. Can you speak uh, as close as you can to the microphone? Because I think I have uh, Robert uh, a little louder than you. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, I'll, I'll speak louder. Uh, Great. You know, uh, let me let me see whether it works on the on the speaker phone. Whether that's going to be better. You tell. No, me no, no. This will be better. I'm sure it's always better when you speak directly. Okay. Oh, you're, you're saying directly. Just well, speak. I'm hoping so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in any event, I was saying that uh, we're, we're in a global crisis. Uh, uh, how serious it is, we're, we're not very sure. On the other hand, uh, binary economics uh, does tell us that uh, you can't uh, increase uh, consumption unless you increase production. It's a very simple fact. That, uh, and in the meantime, what's happened in the world, in, in America, we've been consuming at about uh, uh, 7 percent uh, faster rates of consumption than we are producing. But a lot of that gets down to money and the misuse of money, the misuse of credit, and uh, what I would say a system uh, that uh, has created a form of slavery, wage slavery, and welfare slavery. Uh, and this is uh, because uh, America and the world since the Great Depression, uh, I think to a large extent, we can trace um, a, a much of the problems of bad ideas, basically bad ideas within academia. We've been following Keynesian economics, which was never really intended to address uh, the maldistribution of ownership and economic power. So until we're ready to look at a new framework in order to better understand why there has been a collapse uh, of uh, the, uh, the debt structure, we've been consuming more than we have been producing, we have, we have uh, trade uh, deficits with the world, uh, our monetary policy uh, uh, perpetuates centralized control and ownership. Our tax policies do the same. So we're really dealing with structures, institutions that have been created by human beings and therefore can be recreated by human beings. But we do need a new paradigm. And I think the best 
textbook around on it. I, I have to honor uh, uh, Robert Ashford and, and Rodney Shakespeare because I think it's a superb textbook. It should be taught in all the high schools and in all the colleges because uh, our soft sciences uh, are where academia is falling short. Uh, that's whether you were talking about the law or the study of economics or any of the soft sciences because they do not respect, they don't integrate the simple logic of binary economics. I could, uh, uh, Robert has said it many times, I can say that you know, a question was posed, what is binary economics? What are you talking about? Well, the idea is that if you look at the real world, the world of production, you, there are two sweeping categories of inputs to the productive process. Uh, namely, on the one hand, people, and on the other hand, all kinds of things. Excuse me, I just want to say that as you're speaking, what I'm going to be showing are um, some of the pictures of you and the Pope, and then I've also got uh, this homestead stock certificate, just to kind of give people a feeling that, uh, that you know, this is knowledge that could put something in their hands. Well, no question Even about if other that, and also we... We have a, a comprehensive uh, a blueprint for change uh, in our book called Capital Homesteading for Every Citizen, which, which is aimed at uh, saying the specific uh, tax system, a very simple, specific tax system, which would, which would be more fair and more simple and, and, and would uh, uh, facilitate broadened ownership, but more important, is getting control over the Federal Reserve and and the uh, and the money system because that's the lubricant for change. But I just want to very quickly say what is binary economics? It's a recognition that human beings are bought what they've been for for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, there's no traceable scientific evidence that we've changed. You can train people, you can educate them up to a point, but we all know by looking around, by living in the world, that the real change is taking place at an exponential rate outside of human beings, in our technologies, in our structures, machines, infrastructure. That's what's changing. That's what's changing in the world. In the meantime, the economic system, particularly the financial side of economics, which is supposed to simply be a lubricant for, for change, uh, uh, that we finance our capital in ways that concentrate ownership in a, into a very tiny elite. Uh, the top 1% uh, has more accumulated financial capital than the bottom 95%. So this is telling you that something's out of whack if, in fact, production is taking place through what Kelso called capital. And he wasn't talking about financial capital. He was talking about plant structures technology. And if we read people like Ray Kurzweil in, in his book, uh, the, uh, where he's talking the age of the spiritual machine through computerization, uh, we're going to eventually have machines that can outproduce uh, thousands of human beings, uh, uh, outcompute, outthink. And so we really have to get a grip. If we want to deal with the world, we have to change uh, the laws and institutions. We, we don't have to topple them. We don't have to destroy. It's a matter of transformation. And this is when we talk about social justice. We're not talking about the problems. We're talking about a virtue, a moral virtue, that we work together to, to change the, the human tools, the, the social technologies, so, laws, say, institutions, uh, central uh, banking, etc., so that we can then begin to connect people to the changes that are taking place so that if they own, they will receive the fruits of what they own. And as we move to away from the wage slave system of today, uh, we can begin to liberate the human beings, uh, provide a much more free, but uh, we look at justice as, as, as the missing element. The, the, this is what Kelso, in my view, I can't understand binary economics unless I understood Kelso's principles of economic justice. So it's really a question, of, it's, 
at the at the basis of all of uh, of binary economics is is a is a, a, a moral concept. Say, Norman, I would just like to make a comment on that based on my experience. I'm dealing with a lot of broken-hearted people on many levels, and, and I, I'm actually sitting here next to Posar, who is an example of some of the uh, extreme problems with our justice system. And I think a lot of people feel that they would be better served never to have believed in the myth of justice in the first place. So I still feel that the practicalities and the nuts and bolts of binary economics could also appeal to those people. And I thought perhaps, I know Robert has a different viewpoint, maybe he could respond to what you've just said since you're two binary economists who, who understand this topic more deeply than the rest of us, and then also give us a feeling of Lewis Kelso, who was, who was a mentor to both of you. Would you like to do that, Robert? Well, first of all, let me say everything that Norman Curlin said is, is really correct. And, and I, I just wish that there were, were ways to communicate the listening audience and the viewing audience all the depth and the profound um, um, truth in what he says. And so on one level, I'm, I'm in complete agreement on that score. Uh, and the, the ownership is clearly the key. Uh, ownership is broader. Ownership is the key to soaking up the huge unused capacity that we have. Uh, broader ownership is the key to bringing the markets to a place where they really do fairly price the inputs of capital and labor. Ownership is the key uh, to unlocking the concentrated political power that we see. It, it, it's a transformative uh, phenomenon, and, and I think there's, there's just no doubt about that. And, and understanding the principles of binary economics will clearly enable people to pursue um, a level of justice which is really right now uh, beyond the dreams of most people and beyond their hopes. And so I'm, at that level, I think I'm just in, in complete agreement with normal Norm. Where, where we have a slightly different emphasis is, is that I think that there is a, a, a factual truth to binary economics, which Norm doesn't dispute. He agrees with it, a factual aspect to it which um, you could begrudgingly conce concede, even if you were the most monstrous person in the world, absolutely having no interest in justice whatsoever, there's this single uh, factual proposition, which is, to me, uh, the foundation for, for the key to the solution. And, you know, you say, do, we, do you believe in justice? I always remember the whimsical comment, do I believe in justice? I've even seen it once or twice in my life. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it, there's a the potential there, but it, but it blinds us. And, um, and so I think that's the key. And so from my perspective, and I'm going to just build on what Norm says, uh, the binary and binary economics is that there are two productive factors. There's the labor factor, the human factor, and there's everything else, the non-human factor. And everything that's non-human that can be owned is something that Adam Smith and Karl Marx and John Maynard Keynes and Lewis Kelso called capital. Now, what the audience has to understand is that the word capital has two diametrically opposed meanings. And if people could to understand their rights, if they could just begin demanding of the, of the media and of, of experts that when you say capital, you mean real capital, which is on the left-hand side of a balance sheet, which is like what Norm says, land, machines, tool structures, or do you mean financial capital, which is on the right-hand side of the balance sheet? They're as different as night and day. Uh, real capital does work. Financial capital is a claim on the work done by real capital. It's, it's, it's an absolute opposite. You know, a mathematician will tell you, if you let 1 equal to minus 1, then you can start with any set of propositions and, and prove everything in its opposite. And that seems to be what's going on with uh, conventional economic theory, because you'll hear economists talk about real and ca financial capital in the same breath. What is key is that capital does work in the same way that labor does work. A human can haul a sack, a horse can haul a sack, a truck can haul a sack. A human can calculate, a computer can calculate. A human can dig, a steam shovel can dig. A, a, a human can, can walk. Uh, people walkers to move people. And capital does work, and the way Norman talks about it is right. The big difference is not what the work that you love the work, 
and in a society where capital can do ever more of the work and has ever greater productive capacity, unless that, the, the acquisition of that ownership, the acquisition of that ownership, not the giveaway, but the acquisition of that ownership is more broadly dispersed, they will never distribute the income that's necessary to profitably purchase what is produced. Right. And it's just, it's just a simple, now that's a factual proposition. I always kid Norm. I say, Norm, you could be the king of England wanting to own, Henry VIII, wanting to own everything, uh, hate, hateful that, that the lords have got some of the land, wishing that the people just worship you the way they worship pyramids, and still begrudgingly admit that capital does its own work just the way labor does, that capital can buy itself for the poor more profitably than it can buy itself for the rich, that it can soak up on use, use capacity, and it can promote steady growth. You could, you could hate that proposition. You could hate justice, but still begrudgingly admit that proposition. And that's Robert, the secret. That's the secret, Robert, let that, me, that the media and that the power elite is trying to hide. Right. I, I, I really want to respond because, because I, I, again, we're, we're not in any disagreement because I, I think the two of us understand the logic and principles of Kelso. Uh, but I want to say this about justice. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, Norman. Norman, could you explain who Lewis Kelso is? Then I just wanted to. Uh, Lewis Kelso is a man who, who in the depression, uh, uh, had an insight. Uh, he couldn't understand why, uh, it, 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 as a young person, he's he's watching trains go by instead of carrying c commodities and goods and food. It was it, it, people were going out, uh, 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 unemployed people searching for some way to, to survive, and and he had the insight uh, that that there must be another answer. So then uh, Kelso, during the Second World War in Panama, uh, uh, sat down and wrote a book, and 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 it eventually was published. Uh, uh, he, he took it out of the closet many years later during, after the war, and he met with, uh, with uh, Mortimer Adler, who encouraged him to write this book. And the two of them collaborated in what, to me, is a, a I hate the title, but I think the book is, 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 is a gold mine of ideas. Why do you hate the title? It's called The Capitalist Manifesto. And then there was a second book after that that the two of them wrote, and, and Robert and I both agree on this. It was called The New Capitalist, but the most important part was the, uh, was the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the rest of the title. It said it's a, it's a, a proposal to free economic growth from the slavery of saving. A great insight because Kelso saw in credit, in these things you can't see, credit and money are not, uh, 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 they're only symbols of value. They're only used, I call them lubricants. Uh, all they represent are the ability of people to make promises within a society in which promises are kept. If you misuse it, as it is now, and this is the reason that we're having a, uh, 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 a uh, collapse of the money system. If you misuse it, uh, it will it it will eventually cause uh, a bubble, and the bubble will burst, and people won't know what to do with it. But Kelso had that insight about credit. But but let me uh, let me. Uh, you, you asked who he is, but I really want to get to to justice. Well, I, I'll say a little more about Kelso. He he taught law at the University of Colorado for a while, and then he went to the West Coast, and he became one of the most uh, prominent lawyers in San Francisco. Uh, he, headed, uh, he specialized in finance and corporate law, and, uh, and uh, uh, he was the inventor of something called employee stock ownership plans. Uh, and Robert worked for his firm. I was the Washington counsel for, for uh, Kelso. I also headed up the... Uh, the center, uh, uh, the Institute for the Study of Economic Systems. Uh, when it for, I, I became the executive director when I first met with Kelso. Kelso, uh, I came out of the civil rights uh, uh, war on poverty. Uh, I was very heavily involved from the time I left law school uh, to to the time that 
I, I finally saw that the war on poverty was going to collapse, and somebody introduced me to Kelso's ideas. And I suddenly saw, my God, why didn't I think of this? I had started, been in the law and, and economics program at the University of Chicago, and they teach free market economics, but that was not satisfactory. Uh, and, and, and then when I heard uh, of Kelso's idea, it took me about two minutes to, to listen. I said, my God, why didn't I think of that? Of course. This is a way in which you can have a market economy with private property and limited government and power to the people through ownership. Because now, it, one of the, there are two words I want to just deal with. One is called property, and the other is justice. But first, let me talk about property. Property are not the things that we own. It's the power and rights and privileges and responsibilities you have with respect to land, structures, genes, robots, uh, whatever that's producing marketable goods and services. And it tells you whether you, you have power or somebody else. If you have property, it's, it's the linkage you have to things. It's, uh, it's the power, the control you have. And if you don't have property, somebody else will have property, whether they're bureaucrats of the state as, as under Marxism or, or, or a handful of, of, uh, of, of plutocrats. They will have the power. And, and so Kelso's idea, it's a, it became very clear to me that, uh, that that was missing ownership because I, I, I would never have understood what property was uh, until I had the, uh, had the uh, grace and benefit of, 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 of studying the law. Now, what's justice? The thing that really turned me on in Kelso when I, when I delved into it deeply was Chapter 5 of the Capitalist Manifesto in which he talked about economic rights and economic justice. And I saw in those principles what was missing. I had, I had been working in Mississippi in the one person, one vote uh, movement down there with, with Medgar Evers and, and the SNCC guys, uh, and I was very close to them. And one of the things they were pushing in the early 60s was participation. Uh, the Students for a Democratic Society, participatory democracy. Well, what the civil rights movement did was focus on political participation, knowing that the ballot was essential for political. But the problem with the civil rights movement and the leadership meant they were Marxists. And so when it came to economics, it was to, to try to redistribute through the state. And that, in knowing that the state that is, government is a very unique institution. It's our only legitimate monopoly. It's a monopoly over force and violence and the instruments of force. And so it's therefore it was dangerous. So you had to have checks on this dangerous monopoly. And the, the, the best check, it's not just three branches of government and different levels of government checking each other. No, no, the best check uh, on the state is to make sure the economic power and the independence of your citizens are, are the ultimate check so that the state becomes dependent, that is government at all levels becomes dependent on people rather than people dependent on government. And so this became, uh, uh, to me, uh, a, a, if we're talking about justice, just so we understand this, the essence, all your religions, the essence of all your religions is justice. And justice means, the essence of justice is the dignity uh, 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 of every human life, every human person. And if a system is unjust, it, it, it prevents people from living lives of quality, of independence, of freedom, so that they can choose. You see, and until we, you cannot have a free society. Free, freedom is limited. There's a limit. You can't use your liberty or your freedom to, to deprive someone else of their freedom, as was done under slavery. Not to, not to uh, uh, cut you off too abruptly, but as someone who doesn't even know what binary, binary economics is, uh, I, I'm listening to and I'm faced with the, 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 the concept that... Um, a redistribution of the wealth is actually going to have to have some mechanism. 
So if, you know, how are you, I don't think binary, binary economics itself answers the question of it's how you're going to re, redistribute the wealth. Good or question. How, Good well, question. You don't have to. Okay? You don't have to. This is a beautiful question. Because one of the, one of the conflicts in the world is that we, we, we're going to take from someone. Uh, we don't have to pull down the rich to, to enrich the poor. Okay? Because, because th change is taking place every day. We, uh, you're, you're adding something like $7,000 of new capital per capita. If, if this is the growth. This is the, this is the new plant and equipment. It's the annual ring on the tree. So you don't have to, you, what you want to do is redistribute access. You want to redistribute opportunity. And also, the rich cannot take it with them. That is, property has a limit too. One of the limits on property is it's limited to your life. So that you can then begin to talk about the old assets through your inheritance uh, inheritance law, so you spread out these large monopolistic accumulations. That you can say is redistribution, but it, it really is. Are you talking? Are you talking about ending property? Are you talking about ending uh, inheritance? Pardon? Are you talking about ending? No, I'm not. I'm saying spread it out. Spread it out. Allow mm. people to to distribute enough to their family and, and friends. That's fine. In 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 modest chunks. In other words, I don't think anybody ought to be getting more than a million dollars through an inheritance. But it, therefore, you can spread it out to artists, to teachers, to, to, to the poor. You see, so that they don't, they don't have to be objects of charity. Hey, hang on, I think Robert has something to say here. Robert? <laughs> Let me just break in, and I'm sorry I have to be rude, but is it no, Posar? Is that, is that your name? Posar, yes. Posar, yes, sir. I want, I want to say that your question is a critical question. And I don't think that, that we're doing justice, as it were, to you and your perspective, because even though I understand what Norm is saying and he understands what I'm saying, I put myself in your position and I would ask the very same question that you are. We, I, I don't think, and it's very difficult to get to the foundation. You ask, what is by We're talking, you know, all about it. And, and I don't know whether I'm going to be able to do that or not. Allow me to, to make one comment about what Norm has said, and then get, just give me a couple of minutes. Uh, Norm is, is, I think, I, I love Norm's notion of justice. It has to do with you, the, you, you cannot have justice unless people own enough to be productive, to be self-sufficient themselves, is autonomous self-sufficient. And that's the only way you control the abuse of power by others who have much more productive capacity than you, and the power of the state. So I'm, I'm in agreement with Norm, and, and I want to make a second point, but, and I know that Norm will want to jump in before this, but I want to make a second point. But let me first of all say that what Norm described about justice, if you read the founding fathers of our nation, mm -hmm. they understood that. They, they understood that property was essential for democracy. Mm -hmm. they, some of the states have not only the right to to property like the Constitution, Massachusetts and Virginia had the right to acquire property. So they, they understood everything that Norm said. What they did not understand is that, now I'm going to try to answer your question, labor and capital are independently productive. Mm -hmm. That technology may make labor more productive in a funny, fuzzy sense, but it always makes capital much more productive than labor. <clears throat> that the capital that buys itself today for the rich can buy itself even more profitably if more people are included in the process. And the, uh, and the more broadly capital is acquired, not taken from Peter to give to Paul, acquired by the earnings of capital, the more we will soak up our incredible unused capacity and promote growth. Now, these are factual propositions. They have, pardon me, Norm, they've got nothing to do with justice necessarily. They happen to conform to my idea of justice and yours, and I think if George Washington understood it, they would, he would have said, right on. But those notions are not what make binary economics different. The thing that we, that, that, that Posar has to, has to and, I, and I wouldn't blame him for not saying, for saying, you know, you didn't explain that strong enough uh -huh. or clear enough. But cap 
capital is doing most of the work today. And the only reason you invest in a capital instrument today is because you expect it to earn something tomorrow. And we cannot distribute enough earnings to people over a period of time. Don't think in a static sense, but in a dynamic sense of a future. We can't distribute earning capacity to people through jobs and welfare when most things are being produced more and more by capital. That's a factual proposition. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with values. Well, it's, well, it's purely it's, a, a fact. You, it may conform to your notion of values. It may enhance your notion of values. It may ring true, but it is not what is new. Say, say Norman, can I ju just jump in here a second? Because I know you're going to respond to this very uh, dramatically and make it even more dramatic, the point. <laughs> As an African-American, I'm sure that Pozar has a feeling of how much this country was built up from the labor of slaves right. and the labor of slaves that built up this country they never participated in the wealth and yet when our constitution was set up from my understanding Adam Smith didn't comprehend that labor is still not the greatest uh, giver of wealth so well, well, I don't know how you can draw that conclusion from uh, from uh, Adam Smith because uh, uh, in terms of what's called the labor theory of value uh, uh, Adam Smith uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and and uh, 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 other philosophers up until Kelsa pretty much presume that all value and you can get it from Marx this is where Marx and Adam Smith were on the same wavelength that everything was, if you read, if you read Adam Smith, everything was going to well, was a, was a product of, of labor. Yeah, the only thing capital does is make labor more productive. Yeah, according to Smith, Norm is right about that. But uh, but but but, 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 okay, but go ahead. But, but, but I must say, but Paul is right about something very deep and important. Uh, African Americans were used as capital. They, they, you had a horse and you had a slave, and you, and they they were real human capital. And, and it is true that our society was, was built up by the horrific process of capitalizing human beings. Yeah, and, and, but Robert... And, that is a huge, that, and, if, and we ignore the terrific, terrific work of, of, these, of the slaves in bringing us where right, we are. And right. we and not you, do that. It, and I'm saying that your economists use the term human capital. So, there's, so in fact, they're treating human beings as things. In, 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 uh, I, you know, I, I, as I say, I, I worked with the people who were, who were fighting against uh, uh, white supremacy in the South, and so you still had a perpetuation of something close to slavery, but, but uh, and this was change, because people knew how to organize, and they were organizing for justice, by the way. Uh, that, that was very clear. Well, now, but I do want to uh, uh, mention the Pozar. I'm not saying, Pozar, that you shouldn't be redistributed, because I'm still for redistribution in the interim, okay? So that through the tax system, you can redistribute, and we've made proposals so that we would uh, eliminate payroll taxes and eliminate uh, income taxes for the first a uh, hundred thousand that a, a person would earn, and it would only be above that level that you would tax. But it would meet all the social security uh, promises that are made, the welfare, uh, the uh, health vouchers, or anything else to help people to be able to live until we begin to grow enough capital and spread it out so that people own it. Remember, one of the principal things about property is that if you own it, so any fruits, anything you produce, belong to you. And if somebody takes it away, it's stealing. And what slavery is, is the stealing of the, of the value uh, of, of a human being in a pre-industrial world. Well, well uh, first, just let me say, I, I, don't, I don't hyphenate like African-American because nobody else seems to be doing it. So I just call myself an African. But, this, but be, <laughs> be, beyond that, um, when you talk about no taxes for the first hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, no, you're going to have opponents 
you know, people who make more than a hundred thousand are basically they're going to feel as if they're now uh, somehow footing the bill that that it was unpaid by those who make less than. He than has to pay for 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 the cost of government. Somebody has to pay for for social security. Uh, right now, you are talking about a system, Medicare and Social Security, for example. Are, uh, the projections are that there are two, uh, that there's 74 trillion dollars of underfunding. Promises have been made, and if you project into the future, as as the baby boomers come on, come on board, the, it, it's a pay-as-you-go system, and and they're saying that it's. $74 trillion of underfunding for both Social Security and Medicare, mostly Medicare. And, and, and what that means is that we're, uh, it's about $250,000 if a newborn comes into the world, every, it's a per capita hidden debt of $250,000. So a newborn doesn't even know that they're going to have that on their back to, to be able to to, to meet the needs of, the, uh, of an aging population. So we have to now really take a look at the whole system. How do we, how, how do we grow an economy, a, gr a green growth, in such a way that we, that we empower the people and, and get the incomes from capital? I'll give you an example of what, what we're talking about under capital homesteading. That, that if, if we just look at the incremental growth, a, a, uh, a person uh, it, it, who would be born today by age 21, they'd have, uh, they'd have a $19,000 income only from the dividend of that growth. This they, they not, uh, they'd own and, and, and de derive after taxes 19,000 uh, 19, uh, by uh, if uh, that baby born today uh, would have a uh, close to uh, uh, their dividend incomes from the time from the beginning to the time that they're age 65 would be close to 1.6 million dollars that's over and above anything that they might get from welfare or anything else that they might get from from their jobs so and it may not be clear to you, Poser, at this point, but that doesn't take anything from anybody. That's all new growth. That's right. And it, and it wouldn't exist as a, as a profitable potential if we didn't broaden ownership. And, and Robert, well, if nobody, out, and I happen to agree, these are conservative numbers. If, 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 the, if up to $100,000, nobody's paying taxes... I didn't uh, say nobody's paying taxes. I said that based on based on our, our our views, this this would balance the budget. It's very important that we balance the budget and meet all the obligations that we promised. Whether it's welfare, social security, Medicare, we have a plan so that it can so that the health system, everyone, you could have a universal health care. Okay, if if you if you uh, adopt capital hope steady. Okay, and that to me is 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 a challenge. It's it's what was missing in the civil rights movement, and that is they didn't know how to bring about economic democracy, and Kelso did. And I brought together, I you know, I, I had uh, you, you remember Stokely Carmichael, I do, who was uh, he 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 was one of the leaders in Black Power, and and Stokely and I met. Uh, it was 1968 in New York. And I explained to him, he was a Marxist, and I explained to Stokely, okay, here's what Kelso's saying. And Stokely listened, and he's a very bright guy. And he said, well, they won't buy it. And I said, Stokely, you just, you just revealed yourself. No revolutionary should ever make that statement because you're, you're trying to appeal to the 99% of people who are powerless, economically powerless. If this is the answer, they, and there is no monolithic they, the haves are not monolithic. You can, you can find some who agree with Kelso, okay? And say this, is, uh, as a matter of fact, there was a book, John D. Rockefeller III, remember this, Robert? It was the, it was the Second 
American Revolution by John D. Rockefeller III, he says this is good because you can create haves out of have-nots without taking from the haves. Now, that, to me, makes sense politically. That's what justice is. Can, can you respond, Robert? I want to emphasize that point. Well, I, I think there's no doubt that, that, uh, that there are people who understand this idea and some of whom are uh, rich and would, would want to help it. So I think, he, but, but I'm, I still remain concerned, and I think Pozar is right, that, that people will oppose this because, that, number one, they believe it is redistribution, even though when you, when you look at it closely, it is not, and because they don't believe that the broader distribution of ownership will promote the economic growth, and, and, and that's the problem. Neither the, neither the right-wing theories of trickle-down, right. nor the left-wing theories of nationalized, nor the middle-of-the-road Keynesian theories right. of redistribute. They all agree on one thing. They all agree that the distribution of ownership is not fundamentally important. And what distinguishes a binary economist is that the binary economist knows that the, that the broader distribution of capital acquisition is meaning, 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 meaning. When you say capital acquisition, you... I, I mean, I mean, buying capital with the earnings of capital. The, the most important economic right, Pozar, that 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 you have been deprived of understanding, is the right to acquire capital. That's real assets. Think of trucks and and and, and computers and machines and all the things that do work that used to be done by human power. The right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. That's the key economic right that poor people are kept in the dark about. You know, we talk about this real estate crisis. You know what, you know what they're all dealing with? They're all dealing with who gets the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. Yeah, but you see, if I, if, if I never... Wall Street investment I, I, bankers. I, I don't want to... I, I mean, it's <laughs> about, but if, the key but if, issue. But if I, if I never owned a truck... Yes. How how do I uh, capitalize from a, a, this? A lender, need, a lender needs two things to loan you the money to buy a truck with the earnings of the truck. First thing he needs is he needs a, a, a projection that the truck will earn enough at a competitive rate to pay back the lender. And the second thing that the lender needs is security in the event that the that the earning capacity fails. Right. Those are the two things. When you hear the old adage, it takes money to make money, what's deeper behind that is it takes a, an ins a, a collateral or an insurance, some security, to enable people to invest in an asset that is expected to pay for itself. Now, and, and, and that, for, for just for example, if you could get, 100% financing on a on a on an apartment building, where the rents would pay for the cost of the building. After the rents, it paid for the cost of the building. You would own the building, free and clear. Well, believe it or not, some people do sweet talk their lenders into 100% financing. Mm -hmm. And if the building were in a neighborhood that you expected to be gentrified, we'll throw out all the poor people. We'll bring in the bring in the rich people, so that that building will bring bigger, better and better and better rents. Capital buys itself all the time. Uh, it's, if you look at America's 3,000 largest companies that own about 90% of capital acquisition today, uh, the, the, even, in, even in recessionary times, you've got billions of dollars buying billions of dollars of capital, capital worth, acquiring capital with the earnings of capital. I don't expect you, uh, uh, over a phone in 15 minutes, to fully... Uh, uh, realize what I'm talking about, and it's not your deficiency. We're talking about a deficiency in education that goes back 20 years, and everybody has it. Even the, even the the rocket scientists supposedly that that brought us into Wall Street supposedly. I mean, their education is entirely faulty. The, the, the whole 20th century was a battle over who gets the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. The essence of communism, right? Well, would you the right to acquire capital? Would, the would, of would you would you agree, Norman, that that this this there's been a battle of the rights to own capital, and the common man doesn't even understand this power? Well, that's right because they're not they're educated to be slaves. Okay, you have a slave mentality because 
people, when they go to, uh, to universities, they're not taught anything about ownership, okay? So, so, so you won't find uh, uh, an, an economist who will say ownership is a method by which we can have a free and just and, and, and growing and prosperous, generally prosperous economy. Now, now, I, I want to answer two. I want to address two things uh, uh, for Posa. Two points. One, I want to give you a real case. Uh, we enabled through credit. Uh, workers to buy out a company is called Mid South Building Supply. And but, but it had Norm, about you, excuse me, Norm. Before you go, I, I have a time constraint. Okay. And, and, you know, you're you are doing so very well, Paula. Do you think it would be all right? Yeah, we only have eleven minutes left. Okay, I just have to. I'm wondering because Norm is doing a wonderful job, and perhaps I could just fade out at this point. Is it would that be a disappointment? Sure, and then I'll have you listen to it so we can see if we can develop this more. Because it has I, because to both a little later on, late maybe tomorrow or something to this, yeah. if you're not streaming immediately. Because you see, Norman, both you guys understand things that we're trying to keep up with. Because even Norman, even with you, you said that when Lewis Kelso said something to you, it was like, aha! Why didn't I think about that? Well, that's because so I, have, I had the good fortune to have studied the law, and if I didn't, I I don't think I would have understood this. I'm going to say goodbye. Okay. Okay, Rob. Is that all right, Paul? Yes, bye, Robert. We'll catch you later. Thanks for joining us. And, 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 and yet... Good, good, good work, Norman. Okay, Norman. thank you, Robert. Thank you, Pozar. Thank, uh, thank you. you. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, Robert. Uh, uh, let, let, me, let me say, had I not studied the law, I would not have understood that, that the law is, is part of the invisible structure that determines whether you have power or you don't. Okay, and, and 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 I think all human beings have within themselves a sense of injustice. You know, it, animals have a sense of injustice, but justice is taught. It's a set of principles. Okay, and and therefore, if you if they don't teach it in the law schools, then you have a bunch of lawyers going out practicing the law, writing the law, and never bringing about justice in society. And if justice is really at the essence of all good societies, all religions, okay, and the notion of the importance of the person, then if we leave that out, it's it it becomes understandable that I could see. But the, I could have had the aha, but I could teach others. You see, I went into Harlem. I was working in Harlem right after the riots in, in, in the 60s, and people understood. One of my closest friends was, was a grassroots leader, and it's Francis. She, she headed up the, she was the economic uh, development uh, uh, leader in the Central Harlem Council and Neighborhood Board. She went around, she understood this, and she used to teach it before she died. And, 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 and there are, it, it isn't hard for people who don't own to understand what I'm talking about if we, if we talk. Now, yes, but but Norman, but Norman, you were you were educated, and I'm trying to. But I can teach. But but, but so, so so therefore, whatever I learn, if I've learned it, if I can't teach it, then I really don't understand. It. No, that I understand. But what I'm I'm just trying to say that what what Robert Ashford once told me was he didn't think you could learn binary by reading. He said you need to have somebody sort of walk you through it. We, there's, there's this concept of an initiator, somebody who can kind of give you that extra energy to take you over a hurdle that the society somehow has... Let, 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 me, let me give you an example in Guatemala. There what was, would... uh, this was at the time of the... Uh, uh, under, uh, it was in a state of siege uh, a number of years ago. And, and one of our people were there organizing a broad-based ownership. We were trying to help the Banana Workers Union of United Fruit take over, uh, and, and we, we came close, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, a million-dollar bribe was, was paid to, <laughs> this came out in the newspapers, uh, came out, it was paid to one of the top government people, and so we lost. But. Uh, uh, the, uh, in the, in the, the, you had a civil war there, and in the highlands of Guatemala, where it's basically Mayan, uh, descendants of the Mayan uh, empire, 
uh, uh, they're very poor. And there was a big plantation, it was a coffee plantation, and the owner came in from Guatemala City, flew into this place called La Perla. And, and uh, he, he got killed. He, he, was, he was shot in front of a, uh, uh, by, by a, a, a guerrilla group from the outside uh, when he was there. And his sons had to do something. And they had to decide, you know, do we just pull out and just leave it to the, gu- uh, to the guerrillas? And, 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 and then he, he decided, well, we'll sell. What we'll do is, is enable the workers to own 50%. We'll become part. It won't cost them anything. And so he went out, uh, 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 Enrique uh, uh, Arenas was, was his name, and he goes out to the, to the uh, plantation, and, and he starts saying, okay, we have a new deal. You're going to be owners of 50%. All the workers here will be owners. And, and he knew that most of the workers there were illiterate, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, had very little formal education, uh, and, and so he began explaining. He said, now, he said to, to one of the, uh, the workers there, do you understand, do you understand what I'm saying? And the worker said, I may not be able to read or write, but I'm not stupid. He said, you see that coffee plant over there? You see the coffee beans I own? Or we own half of those. You see, so it isn't. I I've been all over the world talking about this. Anybody can understand if it's if it's presented in a way that they can see the reality. And yes, that's but all we're talking but about. Norman, I, to, I started telling you about a way. You know, these are real cases. There are something like eleven thousand companies that are employee owned, and, and and many are a hundred percent employee owned. And, and in many cases, the workers never put up a penny. Well, how is it done? It's done on credit. And I was giving you the example of a company where, where the owner was willing to sell to, his, to, to the workers. Mid-South Building Supply, head, headquartered in, in Springfield, Virginia. We arranged... Norman, we only have four minutes left. I'd like to uh, let Posar, you okay. know, be, because Posar is new to this, yeah. just make some statements or comments and Go maybe ahead. you can respond to that. How you take... Because I, I would guess... I would just sort of guess, Norman, that people become discouraged and they just don't think somebody will even try. Well, I think this is the problem. This is the pro- This was the other point. That if you if, if you don't hear and you don't listen and you, and you then then you you have every reason to believe it's hopeless and hopelessness turns to revolution and hopelessness uh, uh, it turns to violence it it is not it, it only when you have a vision of of how to change it in such a way that it's a principled way and as I say and it's a just way if you ignore justice you'll never have peace in the world well what about the picture so that you know so that if you say uh, he cannot understand it I don't believe it I think it's a no, question of allowing him to he ask his questions and have have somebody who's knowledgeable be able to answer the questions in a way he can understand them I have a picture of you here with the Pope. Would the Pope give some power and hope to pose our feeling that there will be justice by a big institution? Well, you know, he blessed our work, and I'm not a Christian. I know. Okay? So, 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 but, but, but he, he, he blessed our work because this is consistent. Now, even though I'm not a Christian, I'll say that the, the most intelligent writings on justice, social justice, are in the Catholic uh, social teachings. Uh, it goes back to 1891, when, when they were trying to deal with Marx. They said that the way to end the class struggle between the workers and the owners is to make the workers into owners. And so, so there's a, since 1891, uh, there have been a, a series of, of, of encyclicals on social and economic justice. And this particular pope, Pope John Paul II, really understood this stuff. In that meeting where you see the two of us, actually we had people from the Solidarity Movement. This is before the, the Russians, uh, before the Solidarity Movement was, was victorious. We had a couple well, with us. Uh, uh, so that, and, 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 and,